Okay, good afternoon and welcome to the 32nd anniversary of the Miami Book Fair. If we can come in quietly, if we're still looking for a seat, thank you very much. I'm Dr. Nicholas Beza, I'm the volunteer room host, and we're delighted to have you here with us this afternoon. It's now afternoon. If you've noticed, there's a huge schedule of events all over the campus, and I hope you're enjoying many of them. This year, we also have an additional opportunity for you to become a friend of the book fair. And if you want to do it personally, um, downstairs in room 3104-11, you can join up and become a friend of the book fair. Um, and also, you can support the book fair by texting BOOK to 501-501 to donate $10. You'll receive a text back, you just need to say yes, and you're done. Quick and easy. We're also grateful to our sponsors, including the Knight Foundation, OHL Ariano, and the Bachelor Foundation, and so many more that you'll see on signs posted all over the fair. Miami Book Fair doesn't end tomorrow. This is a year-long event, and so we hope you'll participate throughout the year. After our presentation, there'll be a brief question and answer session, and the author will be off, off excuse me, we'll be autographing books immediately after the session just down the hall and to the right. So if you would now kindly silence your cell phones and other electronic devices, here to introduce our special guest is Judge David Young. Judge Young. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Hope everybody is doing well. I want to thank you for being here today. I am happy to introduce Peggy Noonan. Peggy was President Ronald Reagan's speechwriter, and no one will ever forget the proud the President's words after the Challenger incident helped us cope with that tragedy. And those words were authored by Peggy Noonan. Peggy, as any good journalist, any good writer, is extremely quotable. And this is my, one of my favorite Peggy Noonan quotes. Don't fall in love with politicians. They are all a disappointment. They can't help it. They just are. She is an author of eight books, five of which were on the New York Times bestselling list. She writes a weekly column for the Wall Street Journal, and she's a frequent guest on the Sunday morning news shows. Her latest book, The Time of Our Lives, Collective Writings 12, for the first time it encompasses all of Noonan's writings in one volume. In the book, she chronicles her career in journalism, the Reagan White House, and the political arena. So we have a special treat. Not only are we gonna be hearing from Peggy Noonan, but Jackie Nesperall, the anchor for Channel 6, the Emmy anchor, Emmy award-winning anchor, is going to be doing a question and an answer with Ms. Noonan. And I promise you this, it's going to be an enlightening hour. It's going to be one you're not going to want to, you're going to want to pay attention and you will not forget because these two remarkable individuals have played such an important role, not only in our community, but in our nation. It gives me great pleasure to present Peggy Noonan and Jackie Nesperl. Big round of applause for Peggy Noonan. Thank you for being here. Thank you, it's lunchtime and you stayed. Thank you, just thank you. It's a great book. Um, if, you have, if you don't have it yet, you should. I, I finished it in, in hours, it, it's just wonderful. Peggy, thank you so much for coming here to Miami and for gracing us with your presence. Thank you, uh, Jackie, thank you for giving me a uh, a Saturday afternoon, you've got a Sunday show coming up. You are a great broadcaster. There are a number of things you could have been doing this beautiful Saturday afternoon. I am touched and I am honored that you agreed to do this. We kind of begged her to do a Q&A with Not me. And true. We're, we're very happy that, uh, that she, she said yes. It's my pleasure. So let's get started because I don't know if you remember this song, Native New Yorker. Um, yeah. I'm a native New Yorker. Yorker. 
And when I, re- I, I was, I've been reading so much about you, and that, that song, for whatever reason, came to mind because you are a tough cookie. I think that is fair enough. In my own way, I am a New York girl. I was born in Brooklyn, New York. To uh, yay, Brooklyn. Brooklyn. Uh, I was born in uh, Brooklyn, New York, big Irish Catholic family, um, um, moved out to Massapequa and Massapequa Park in Long Island in Nassau County when I was five or six years old. But the lived in northern Jersey, came back to New York, but the ethos of my life has been I am a New Yorker, and I'm very flattered that you thought of that song, for indeed... I'm a native New Yorker. Absolutely. So when did you realize that you wanted to be a journalist? Um, I always realized, Jackie, that I was a writer. I actually knew that from childhood. I was a great reader. And it occurred to me, I mean, from the time I was this eye, I, I loved books. It, one of the beautiful things about the old culture in America is that it was so boring that reading books was actually fun. It's sort of what you did for fun. Um, So I was a great reader. It occurred to me at some point along the way that somebody must be the person who makes up the story in the books. I think I found out that person is called a writer. I have actually, this isn't in the book, but but this is actually a true story. When I was in the third grade out in Massapequa, Long Island, I had a teacher named Miss Brown. Miss Brown told us one week before Thanksgiving, when Thanksgiving was on everybody's minds, she said, go home tonight. Your only homework is write a, a, um, a poem about Thanksgiving. So I was not a kid who always did her homework, but I found this really kind of an exciting idea, and I literally remember writing the poem about Thanksgiving and trying to describe how a house smells when Thanksgiving food is being made and how nice it is to eat it. I did this, this whole thing, and I handed it in the next day. The day after that, the teacher says, oh, uh, before she lets us go for, I guess, Thanksgiving vacation, she said, oh, I'm going to give everybody back their papers, and I've graded them. So I've graded your poems. And she gave back the poems of every kid in the class with a grade on top but me. And I immediately thought, wow, I had so much fun writing that poem, and I really thought that poem was good. But I got a feeling that poem was really not good, and the teacher has not given it back to me because she's going to call me up to have a little private conference and tell me what I'd done wrong. That isn't what happened. Instead, Miss Brown said, and now before you all go, class... I want to read the poem I liked best in this class, and I thought it was very good, and I want you to hear it. And she read my poem, and she gave me an A. And I actually thought after that, well, I'm a writer. And it was, I mean, it was a beautiful, a beautiful moment in my life to barely know what a writer was and yet also know I was a writer. So I didn't know what kind of writer I'd be. And for the next 15 years, I thought, well, maybe I'll be a reporter writer. Or maybe I'll be a nurse writer. You know, maybe I'll be an actress writer. No, maybe I I will work in handicrafts and write about it. I just knew whatever I'd be, I'd be a writer also. Does Miss Brown know that she had this influence on you? You know, she does not. And I have to admit to you, it's long ago and far away. Only a few years ago did I try to find her and a few other teachers, and they were no longer with us. My best friend from those days became a a teacher out in the Massapequa High School system. And so she tried to help me find a few people we could not. I I can't even imagine because you're considered a pioneer in terms of this industry. And I can't imagine going into this business in the 1970s and then going to the White House in the 1980s. Give us a little description of what that was like, especially in the 1970s as a woman journalists getting into this industry? Well, when I was a young woman, I was in my 20s in the 1970s, and I was part of a huge wave of women just entering places like CBS, NBC, and ABC. And we were, this wave of young women, 
just out of college, we were kind of shocking for the old fellows who were on the desk at CBS, the fellows who were editors and producers. I came to learn in time that those old guys, who I thought were like antique, because they were like 57. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I thought that was like the oldest person in the world. I've, those old guys turned out to be, a bunch of them, the Murrow boys. They were the boys taught, who essentially, along with Ed Murrow during World War II, had invented broadcast news writing. And were the guys who, some, in the case of, say, Charles Collingwood, who literally were broadcasting live from Europe in the lead up to World War II. So I'm walking in with this whole wave of young women out of college. We've already had our first job. Now we, we've made it to the leagues, to CBS News. We were informal, we were colorful. We all had, as I remember it, tight jeans, fry boots, aviator glasses like Gloria <laughs> Steinem, and various lengths of hair. And these poor old Murrow guys, they looked at us like we were an invading Martian army. <laughs> But here's the beautiful thing. They taught us everything they knew. They taught me everything they knew. And, and so it was a fabulous experience. So they welcomed you? They, well, let me put it, they were tough old fellows. I can't say they welcomed us. They accepted us, and then they got to know us, and then we, we were friends. Mm -hmm. That's sort of how it went. You worked with Dan Rather? I worked with Dan Rather. I started out at, at CBS in that newsroom doing a, a writing hourly a radio network news reports like the old World News Roundup at 8 a.m. on any CBS station. Um, I became an interviewer and I uh, then went on to write Dan Rather's daily radio commentary every day for the three years before I left CBS to work for Ronald Reagan. Quickly, and I know that I'm, I'm going ahead before uh, I should, but how did you feel about what happened with him after the whole George W. Bush fiasco? Oh, um, uh, uh, I, Dan Rather was a great person to write for. In my experience with him, he was completely fair. He was just such a great guy. Here's what we did together. I had to write Dan's five-minute commentary on the news that went up on the CBS radio network at about 4 p.m. each day. So it's Dan being thoughtful about the news. But so much of the news in America, even then, was political. And Dan, I perceived to be to the left of me. I was a young woman becoming, for, for serious reasons, having read the canon and pondered a great deal, I was politically conservative, so it was a little bit of an awkward fit, but it was a great job to be offered. Dan had just been made um, the anchor of the CBS Evening News, replacing Walter Cronkite. It was a huge job in that three-network universe of the old days. So to be Dan's writer was a fabulous honor and a great thing, but as I say, it was an uncomfortable fit. So I went to him after working for him for a few weeks, and I said, you know, Dan, I feel like I'm not capturing your voice and your views because we come from such a different place. You politically are liberal and I politically am conservative. Dan listened to me and he did not say that he was politically liberal, but he did admit that I was politically conservative, <laughs> um, which made us both laugh. He then said, look, this is how we're gonna do this show. You're gonna meet with me every morning at 3 a.m. We're gonna choose the topic. We're gonna to discuss how, if it's a right-left thing, how the conservatives feel about the topic and how the liberals feel about the topic. And then at the end, we'll conclude, I'll more or less suggest where I stand and where I come out on the issue because it's my show. And I said, you know what, Dan, that's completely fair. I can do that. And so, that's how we did the show. Show had a huge following. Conservatives were so surprised to hear their viewpoint fairly and accurately portrayed that they thought it was a conservative show. Liberals were so happy Dan was giving the liberal case and then usually taking the side of the liberal case. So they were happy too. So it had a huge following. I'm so sorry, I went off on the dynamics That's of okay, that and forgot what, what the question was. With the whole George W. Bush 
fiasco. Oh, oh my goodness. Well, I'll tell you, here's a moment that few people, I guess, will have had in life, and I will never forget it. In 1988, George H.W. Bush was running for president. Now, I supported him. I thought he was the right man of those available for the job. I worked for him. I was, during his campaign in 1988, his speechwriter. I didn't join his White House after he won, but I was his speechwriter. Okay, one night, I'm at home. Uh, I had just had a baby, so I'm doing most of my work at home. I'm at home in Virginia watching the news, watching CBS, my old team, and suddenly Dan Rather, my beautiful friend, my former boss, is in a fight with George H.W. Bush, my current boss. And it was Dan Rather trying to more or less kind of, I'm afraid I, I would say a little bit, mug George H.W. Bush over the serious issue of his involvement, if any, in the Iran-Contra scandal. That a terrible fight. I got the funniest feeling in my stomach. I felt like um, I was a child and mom and dad were fighting upstairs. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It felt so personal and it felt like two people were fighting who I cared about a lot. Um, so, so, you know, Dan... Dan had a bit of an issue with the Bushes. In part, it may have been a little Texas. Dan was a Texas boy. The Bushes, at the, from a certain point, were Texas guys. Dan was on this side. The Bushes were on this side. At the end of the day, I don't think there was that much dis area between them. But I think Dan made a bad mistake with his uh, reporting on George W. Bush's um, military, military history. And, and it was uh, just uh, one of those unfortunate things. We have to talk about the Reagan years. Yeah. As you've mentioned, you were a speechwriter for the great communicator himself, Ronald Reagan. How was that and how did that come about? Oh, that was just so beautiful. It was a fabulous time. You know, looking back on those days, I knew it was a fabulous time in history. And I knew also, I mean, I could tell that this would be, I, it was my sense that, uh, especially if you're Irish and love politics, every generation gets a president. You know, there's, every generation gets to think, that's my guy. For my grandmother, it was Franklin Roosevelt. She kept an NRA, we do our part sign, an old crumbling sign on the window of her little apartment in Brooklyn long enough so that I remember seeing it in the 1950s, so that means 20 years. For my parents, it was Jack Kennedy, all the way with JFK, and for me, it was Reagan, and I knew it was Reagan. So I was so excited to work for him. Um, I had gotten a name for myself at CBS as Dan's writer. I'm, I'm gonna make this a very short story. All I wanted to be was a speechwriter for Ronald Reagan. I had faith in him, I agreed with him, I thought his approach to the world was the correct one and the constructive one. So all I wanted to do was work for him, even though I was working for Dan. And I also knew me, I couldn't try to be anything but what I was, a writer. So when I would meet conservatives at CBS, we used to have a lot of shows at CBS on radio and TV side, and now and then, a visiting conservative would come in and, and be brought in to do a talk show. And I'm telling you, CBS in those days was so friendly and sweet. Everybody knew I was politically conservative, for if they asked me, I would tell them, and we'd have interesting debates. CBS was so sweet that when some visiting conservative from a place like Washington was coming through for a talk show, the producers and writers would stop if I was in the newsroom, and they'd put their arm around me and say, this is Peggy Noonan. She's our conservative. <laughs> and it was very cute and sweet. The White House heard about me. It turned out the guy who ran speech writing in the Reagan White House had 20 years before been the conservative at CBS News. He had worked a floor above me, and he had gone on to do other things and then wound up working for Reagan. He heard about me. He heard that, that I loved Reagan. He called me up. And he said, you know, my name is Ben Elliott. I run uh, speech writing here at the White House. I heard about you. I know it's not easy to be a conservative in the mainstream media. I know it's not easy to be where you are. I just want you to know I admire it and keep on keeping on. I know you got a great job with Dan. 
if you ever, you know, come down to Washington, I'd love to know you just come by, knock on my door. I, at that point, did something wholly unlike me in that it was deeply proactive and a total, complete lie. <laughs> and I said, you know, I'm coming down to Washington tomorrow. <laughs> he laughed in my face. He just knew it was a lie. And he said, so, well, I guess you're coming down tomorrow. And the next day, I took the Eastern shuttle down to DC, and I just went to see him. And I said, this is who I am. This is what I do. I am not kidding when I tell you I would give anything to be a speechwriter for President Reagan. I want to help him, and I, I even have a feeling of destiny about it. I am supposed to do this. This began a process that went many months in which they vetted everything I'd ever written, in which they had me do make-believe speeches for the president. Oh, my God, they made it very hard for me. And then they offered me the job. Then I went through a great show of making believe I had to deliberate about it, you know? So I'd walk around and say to people, gee, I've been offered this job. Do you think I should take it? And they'd go, yes, stupid. I went to Bill Moyers, who was at CBS in those days. Fabulous man. And I said, and Bill, of course, had worked for Lyndon Johnson in a very serious role as an advisor and also as head of communications. And I said, Bill, and he was now doing commentary for CBS. I said, Bill, what do you think? What should I do? And he said, Peggy, I mean, this isn't even a question. How many people in the history of the United States have been lucky to work in the White House for a president of the United States? At most 20,000, possibly? You have to do this. And of course, I knew I had to, and I did. And it was fabulous. Let's, let's talk about the Challenger explosion and that famous speech now that is really in, in the books now as one of the greats. That was such an interesting day. That was January uh, 1985. Yes, mm -hmm. January 1985 or 86. Oh my God, I'm blocking. 86? 86. January 1986. Thank you, sir. Um, there is in my book a chapter called a lecture. And what it is is a lecture that I gave to some students at Harvard University a few years ago. They were uh, members of a class on government. Traditionally, many members of that class do go into government. I wanted to tell them as a visiting a person invited to speak to them about, I wanted to tell them one thing, and it was this. You're going to go into government, and after a while, your job is going to bore you. Every day is going to be the same. It's going to be the same old, same old. And you know, you're going to start to cut corners a little bit or get a little bit lazy. But let me tell you what government is like. Someday something big is going to happen and it's going to explode and the world is going to turn upside down. And on that day, you are going to have to bring the best that you have within you to that moment. And everybody around you is going to have to bring the best that they've got to meet that moment. And indeed, I think that's what we did that day. Um, I the was poem. I wanted to talk about the poem. Oh, oh, so sorry. No. Um, a terrible accident had happened. The Challenger had blown up. We all watched it live on TV. And a signal thing happened. I, the, the White House, when a tragedy like that occurs, Everything pops. Everybody's on the phone. Everybody's in a meeting. Everybody has to have an urgent communication with somebody else. I just removed myself from all of that and thought, I know the president is going to have to speak in the next few hours because this was a huge tragedy. And someone's going to have to start working on that. So I went to my boss. I said, I'm going to start work. He said, go. So I sit in my office and I start working as everything's exploding around me. At a certain point, my boss's little girl, Meredith, who for some reason had gone to work with him that day, walked into my office. She was my little friend, seven, eight years old. She looked at the TV and looked at me and said quizzically, the teacher was on the rocket. Is the teacher all right? And at that point, I remembered every school child in America was watching the Challenger go up because indeed, there was a school teacher, a public school teacher, Krista McAuliffe, who was on that space shuttle. She was there. 
as an astronaut, it was so exciting for the schools of America. So all the kids were watching it in assemblies, all the teachers, everybody was shocked. So it occurred to me, whoa, so the president is going to have to do a speech that is aimed at eight years old, at those who are eight years old and those who are 18 and those who are 80 without patronizing anybody, as we all do when we talk to the young and we talk to the old. Um, as, I, as I worked, a woman ran in from the National Security Council. She had just talked to Reagan. She'd been in his office. She'd been at a meeting with him. She wrote down everything he said. She brought it into me. That became the spine of the speech. At the end of the speech, I had been out of the corner of my eye watching CNN all that morning after the, the blow up. And they kept at CNN showing over and over again these poor astronauts in their astronaut uniforms, leaving the holding area and going to the, to the space shuttle itself. And as they left in their astronaut uniforms with their big heavy gloves, they waved goodbye to the television cameras in this jolly way that said, see you in a few hours or a few days. It was very poignant. Watching that, I thought of something I learned in the seventh grade in Massapequa, Long Island, in English class. It was a poem by John Gillespie McGee, Jr., called High Flight. It was about the joy of flying. And this was written at a time when most people had not flown. It was the 1930s. John Gillespie McGee, Jr. Was a, became a fighter pilot in World War II, as World War II began, and died in the run-up to the war. But he left behind this beautiful poem. It ended with the words, and slipped the surly bonds of earth to touch the face of God. It just came to me. I just remembered it from seventh grade. Here's the thing. I made that the end of the speech, but there was a mystery. I knew that Ronald Reagan would only use those words if he knew that poem, and if that poem meant something to him. And I hoped he knew it, and I hoped it meant something. But just to be careful, the speech ended actually before that paragraph, so it would be easier for the president to kill that paragraph and not say it. We got the speech done. There was no time to ruin it, by which I mean normally presidential speeches are staffed out to hundreds of people who can't help themselves. They think defensively or they think aggressively, whatever they're doing. They change everything around. Sometimes they don't know good from bad, and so they make things a little worse or take out something that's good and leave in something that's dumb. So the staffing process can kill a speech. In this case, there was no staffing process, essentially. It was more or less me to a small group around the president to the president. We were in a big hurry. Boom, boom, boom. I put on the TV like everybody else. I watch Reagan, and indeed, Reagan looked very disappointed, not disappointed, he was sad, and he was dashed. He, was, he looked stricken on TV. He did the speech. It had everything that he wanted. And at the end, he quoted the John Gillespie McGee Jr. poem. But he was, you, it was the first time I could ever see Ronald Reagan was really upset. And he was upset in part about the teacher, in part about this it was a dreadful tragedy in part because he understood it was the height of the Cold War. You know, you're going to have to let the world know a little bit. No, 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 Soviet Union, this is not, quote, a military disaster. There was a lot going on, a lot going on in that speech. Reagan left the Oval Office after that speech feeling that it had not succeeded. In the words of Abraham Lincoln, he felt that it hadn't scoured. Lincoln said a good speech scours, it breaks up the earth. Reagan did not feel that the speech had met the moment. I came to think afterwards that he thought that in part because what, there's nothing you can say that could meet a moment that was that painful to the American people and to you. I picked up from watching Reagan how he felt, and I absorbed it, and I felt it too. So everybody went home by, the, not by that night either feeling very sad about what had happened, the history that had happened, and also in Reagan's part and my part, feeling that we had not met the moment, feeling very disappointed in ourselves. However, something changed overnight. People started reacting. 
the press started reporting. Kids started talking. Something happened overnight. And by the time I got into work the next morning, I got the impression, you want to know something? We were too tough. That's OK. That speech did that job. Came home, uh, came into the office. Tip O'Neill had called me. Tip O'Neill, I was, I am a well-known person now. I was not well-known then. Tip O'Neill was the powerful Democratic Speaker of the House of Representatives. I was a little schmagoogie in an office in the old executive office building. Tip O'Neill bothered to find me, call me, and thank me for the work I had done. It was really beautiful. Things like that don't really happen these days, but that happened then. George Shultz called me. The president called. He was totally honest about how he had thought the speech had not worked or had not done what he hoped to do. Um, but before that, he told me, he said, how did you know I knew that poem? I said, oh, Mr. President, I didn't know that you knew the poem. I took a chance. I hoped you knew it. He said, I did know it. You want to know how? Indeed, the poem High Flight had been written on a plaque outside his daughter Patty's grade school. And when he had dropped her off in the morning on the way to work, he would stop sometimes and read the plaque. So that poem was very well known to him and really had meaning for him and so uh, really worked. Then he very honestly told me he had not originally thought that the speech had succeeded in doing whatever should be done, but came to believe by this morning that it had. And I said, well, Mr. President, what made you think that it worked? And there were a number of things that made him feel that it worked, but the most striking one was he said, well, you know, Frank Sinatra called me. And <laughs> Frank Sinatra didn't call me after every speech, let me tell you. It was one of those moments, rarely with Reagan would you absolutely remind that, be reminded that Reagan came up in show business. And he knew when something landed and when something didn't. And he knew who could tell you when something worked. And baby Frank Sinatra was one of his friends who would give it to him straight and tell him if it worked or not. So that is my, my challenger story. The fact is, we all of us there that day, that hectic day, that crazy, painful day, did the best that we could do, and we all made it through. That's an interesting story, especially the part that Frank Sinatra validated the speech. Yes, to absolutely. a certain extent. But what Frank was Sinatra was telling him in show business terms, don't worry, Ronnie, it landed. Mm -hmm. You know that phrase? Yeah. Did the joke land? Did mm -hmm. the joke not land? It landed. All right, it landed. Mm -hmm. What was your relationship with him after that, with the president? Uh, with the president, after the challenger mm -hmm. speech, um, sometime after that, uh, maybe um, six or eight months later, I left. There was kind of a little power collision in the White House where the people I had worked for and who had hired me left and went on to other things. And a fellow, a, a fabulously colorful man named Don Regan, came in to be chief of staff for Reagan. And I have great affection for him, but as a chief of staff, he didn't work, and the people he brought in, whom I dubbed the mice, did not work well with speech writing. And I just thought, you know what, I, I, my, my work here is done. However, at the end, a very beautiful thing happened. I went home, I had a baby. Um, Reagan, about three or four months before he left the White House in January 89, asked me, this felt like the greatest honor, he asked me to come in and work with him on his farewell address. Mm. And so I got to work for a few weeks with, the pres with a big, successful American president on the meaning of his presidency. And we worked on it very well, and I, I worked very hard on it. And I, it's a... It's a uh, I think Reagan would say that's a speech of his that nobody talks about, but that was very important to Ronald Reagan and contained a lot of in, advice for the future. We only have a few minutes left before we're going to open it up to some questions here in the audience, but there's a section on politics in the book as well, and I love the section. Um, and I want you to give what you write about in terms of Hillary Clinton and your opinion on Hillary. Oh my goodness, well, the, the, the book, 
I found as I went through my work, I could isolate various themes and put them in various chapters and have just a ball doing it. One of the chapters is called People I Miss about, uh, and I'm going to get to your question in a second, but it, it just pleases me. It's called People I Miss, and it's about people who I was lucky to know who I thought made a great contribution, like Joan Rivers and Tim Russert. Uh, Jackie Onassis, who I didn't know, but I had met and observed her from afar. Tennessee Williams, who's, whose work was so great, Margaret Thatcher. Um, there are, there's a chapter about political disputes. I've been involved in big political arguments, big, you know, I criticize somebody, they criticize back, we're all at war. This I consider to be sometimes painful, but also part of the fun of talking about politics in real time in America. With Mrs. Clinton, I think, I, uh, I think I, I, I'm, I'm blocking a little bit about how much I have about Mrs. Clinton in the book. I know it's plenty, but I think a lot of it uh, revolves around the 2008 election year when she ran against this young guy nobody had ever heard of in 2007 named, what's his name, Barack Obama. So Obama, the insurgent, goes up against Hillary Clinton and her fabulously funded, well-oiled machine. And what happened between them two was an epic, upending event. I never saw a political demolishment like what Barack Obama did to Hillary Clinton. So there's uh, plenty, uh, plenty about uh, Mrs. Clinton and plenty about uh, Mr. Clinton, too. Mm -hmm. When, when you look back uh, to your time with, with Ronald Reagan, which obviously is one of the highlights, as you've mentioned, do you see any Reagan-esque qualities in any of the nominees now for the presidential election? That is a completely fair question, and there are nominees on the Republican side and the Democratic side, and I'll tell you how I look at it. I never see John F. Kennedyan qualities in candidates running for president. None of them ever remind me of FDR. None of them ever remind me of Reagan, and none of them, for that matter, remind me of Lincoln. I see candidates as men and women responding to and living in very much in their time. <coughs> I beg your pardon. I've been talking too much the past few days. They respond to and live in very much in their times. I always hope for them that they will be great. I always hope for them that 20 years from now will say something like, it'll be the year, say, 2040 or whatever it'll be 20 years from now. Let's say it's 2040. I hope we look back and say longingly of some candidate for president, yeah, but is he a Marco Rubio? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, but is she a Hillary Clinton? So I think greatness comes in real time, but is only judged in retrospect. And I just never compare anybody in politics to anybody who came before them. I don't find it helpful, and I don't find it clarifying. We're going to open it up for questions, but you do have a, a quote that I love tacked on your wall that says, do not walk through time without leaving worthy evidence of your passage. Do you feel that you have left an impact? Oh, my goodness. Um, I, th that beautiful quote was said. I went to the, uh, to the, the mass in which uh, Pope John XXIII was recognized as or declared as a saint uh, by the Catholic Church, and that indeed is a quote that I saw on a little pamphlet on a street in Rome from John the 23rd. Do not go through, do not go through life or time. Do not go through, do not go through, through time, time without, without leaving, leaving worthy evidence, worthy of, evidence your of your passage that is written on an envelope taped to my door at home in my office. I'll, I will admit to you one of the reasons I made that and an epigraph of the book is that I think writers are always, writers who are serious about it and trying to do constructive work and trying to be truthful, their efforts are ultimately an, a, an attempt to leave worthy evidence of their passage. That applies to very many 
very many uh, professionals and their efforts. But was I trying to do that? Yes. And do I think it's darn good advice? I sure do. That's why it's taped to my door of my office. I think it's great advice as well. I'm sure you have questions, so let's get right to it. Thank you. Peggy Noonan. Yes, sir. Ms. Noonan, in your column in today's Wall Street Journal, you um, try to analyze what, um, what the qualities a leader should have in this post-Paris world. And you end your column by saying that the next president uh, should have a lot of confidence. And that is a quality that you feel that perhaps maybe the current, present president is lacking. Um, given the candidates that are running and the fact that there's one particular person uh, whose name is Donald Trump seems to be the one candidate who his campaigning is all about confidence and how he's confident he can fix the whole everything in the world. Could you comment on what you think a Donald Trump president might be like and if it's would it be horrible, would be acceptable, would be something new and enlightening? Yeah, it's interesting to be asked that question in Florida because you folks may decisively answer the question, will Donald Trump be the Republican nominee? Uh, you know, in your Florida primary, what you folks do with regard to um, uh, Marco Rubio, Donald Trump, Ted Cruz, that's going to be significant in the, in the choosing of a Republican um, nominee. Uh, look, I, I think Trump is the result of many things. One of the things he is the result of, in my view, is this. The American people, certainly a lot of Republicans, but the American people have looked at the past frustrating, painful, difficult 15 years. And they've thought, what have we had for 15 years from Washington? Okay, two essentially unwon wars, a Mideast blowing up, an economic collapse, if you will, followed by an extremely feeble recovery, indications on education, et cetera, all of them, you know what they are, a culture more bizarre, everything seeming to get worse, past 15 years, who gave us that world? Oh, I know, the most credentialed, experienced, accomplished political figures in America gave us that world. So, what I think Republicans especially are doing this year is saying to themselves without articulating it, uh-oh, I think we're going to have to go outside the political world and judge the experience, accomplishments, background, and history of others. Just broaden, broaden the indicators of what you're looking for, if you will. Trump benefits from that, so does Ben Carson. He's a neurosurgeon. So does Carly Fiorina, a former CEO, a rather, in some respects, controversial one. So I think Trump, who has a kind of natural, earthy political sense, understood the moment we were in um, and moved forward. Uh, I don't know what is going to happen there. I don't always know what to make of his confidence. I'll end with, with this. Because I've been out on a book tour, and because I worked for Ronald Reagan, I get asked about him a lot, but I get asked about him in a very specific way lately. People say, Ronald Reagan was so successful because he was optimistic. He was such an optimist. Wasn't his leadership optimistic? I miss his optimism. And I will say to people, actually, what you miss was not optimism, and he was not always optimistic. Believe me, this was a guy who sometimes took a very stern look at the history of man and what it might produce. He was not a man who had optimism. He was a man who had confidence. He had confidence in himself and his own abilities and powers and ability to think. He was confident in you, the American people, if he explained his case, would back him. He was sure. And he had confidence in the American system. It could be made to work. The Congress and the White House could be made to work together. The executive agencies could work. So this is a man who had confidence. You looked at him, you saw his confidence, and it allowed you to feel optimistic. That's what was going on with Reagan. 
we'll, we'll see with, you know, there are many candidates who, are, who feel certainly a, uh, a personal confidence, a confidence in their own abilities. We'll see if they get to do the rest of the formula. Next yes, question. Yes, sir. Uh, hey, good evening. Uh, so my question, I, I wanted to come back to the challenger speech. I know you spent a lot of time speaking about it. Um, could you have written that speech, and would you have written that same speech if George Bush had had to give it? Um, so that's a specific part of it. And the underlying part of it is, to what extent when you're writing a speech as a speechwriter for a candidate or for a CEO or for whomever, do you have to take into consideration that thought that kept going through your mind, will this resonate with the speaker? Because if it doesn't, it won't resonate with the audience. You, you, it's one of the easy parts of speech writing is taking a chance. You may think the person you are writing for is going to respond very much to and relate very much to something specific that you put in. And that's fine, you may be right, and it'll turn out to be just great. And you may be wrong. And the president, say, if that's who you work for, will simply remove it. So it doesn't matter. So I always tell young speechwriters, throw your best stuff. Do your best stuff. If they don't like it, they'll take it out. All presidents know they rise and fall on their speeches. History judges them by their speeches. Um, would the challenger speech be different um, if it had been with, with George H.W. Bush, I can tell you, of course, yes, because George H.W. Bush's comments in the Oval Office before the speech would have been recorded by the same person who recorded Reagan's, but they would have been different thoughts because he was a different man, so it would have been a different speech. But in a way, I, the, in a way, I guess I just answered that, but it's also hard to answer. If you said to Ted Sorensen, who worked with John F. Kennedy and then attempted to help Lyndon Johnson when Johnson was president for a little while, you know, are your speeches for JFK and LBJ different? And I think his answer, he was a friend of mine, I knew him well, cared about him a lot. I think his answer would be yes because LBJ was not JFK, they were just different human beings. But his answer would also be, but at the end of the day, Ted Sorensen was the writer, so there would have been some similarities, you know? So it's a complicated little dance. Yes, sir. We have time just for one more question. I'm sorry, because Peggy's gonna be signing books. First of all, thank you for coming. We really appreciate you being here. Uh, as someone who has spent several years working with President Reagan, to use eloquence to rise to the occasion of national crises. How would you assess, uh, looking at uh, President Obama's performance in Turkey after the Paris attacks, how would you assess his performance in terms of his comments following the Paris attacks? Yeah, very often. I mean, I don't see the world 100% the way Barack Obama does, the way the president does. And so very often I, I, I feel different from him. I mean, I'm in conflict with his thoughts. My thoughts are different, my convictions also. But after Paris, I felt disheartened by him. I felt he hit a kind of low in terms of missing what was needed in his celebrated news conference in which he was challenged, really quite wonderfully in my view, by CNN's Jim Acosta, who said, Mr. President, ISIS has done this, they've done that, they've done this, they've now done this, they're here. You know, many Americans are feeling frustration and thinking, why can't we get the bastards? That was just an honest, straight, you, you don't get blunter as a question than that. And the president, to my unhappiness, seemed in response to that to be sort of intellectually weary and frustrated that people don't understand the fabulousness of his strategy, which he keeps explaining, and don't you get it? He was defensive. He was not, he was not someone who could explain to you there's a great absence when it comes to Obama and ISIS, and it is an absence of how he thinks about ISIS. Not just what to do about it, what your little strategy supposedly is, but how should we think about it? How should we view it? 
What kind of threat is it? How should we be preparing to meet that threat? What are the possibilities? He doesn't speak about any of those things, which makes you wonder, my gosh, is he not speaking because he doesn't know we need to hear from him? Or is he not speaking because he doesn't actually want to share his thoughts because he thinks they will be unpopular, which makes everybody uneasy. So we're already uneasy enough with these messy, horrible things. And now there's, you know, there's this, the, and now there's a pres, president who's acting less like a presence than an absence. It does no good. It was very bad leadership the past week. We're going to have to leave it at that. The name of the book, The Time of Our Lives. Ladies and gentlemen, Peggy Noonan. Thank you.